guide us onto an Indian airline to Bangalore. Upon arrival, she took us to an Indian clothing store for proper attire, as our polyester clothing was not appropriate and hot. Then we checked into the Shilton Hotel and crashed. The next morning, we were awakened early by birds who had made a nest in our room. We had breakfast with Lynn and Indra Devi, who was also staying there. Indra Devi said she would take us to the ashram on Thursday and asked Swami for an interview on our behalf. That day we explored India. India filled our senses. Flowers everywhere, bright saris, smells of incense curry fill the air. Elephants, camels, oxen, pedicabs, buses, taxis, carts fill the streets, and no traffic lights. Monkeys and lizards scurried everywhere. I was stunned and amazed. This is impossible to process it all. The next day, we taxied to Prashanti Nilayam and checked into our rooms to get ready for afternoon darshan and my first look at this Sai Baba person. And it was my first attempt at putting on a sari. Yards and yards of material <laughs> that kept coming untucked. Well, Lynn came in and pinned me up and made me presentable. As we sat around the sand, around the temple in the March heat, there was only about five lines of people at that time. I think we were about in the second row. I kept thinking if only I could look into his eyes, I would know if he was for real. This was kind of my way of checking people out. Suddenly, all grew silent, and on the men's side of the area, an orange figure floated off the veranda and began gliding around the men's lines. As he approached the women's side, I was taken aback by the grace and rhythm of his movements. He then came and stood in front of my friend and me and asked when she had come. He looked at me and stared deeply into my eyes, then moved on. I'm not sure what actually happened in that moment, except that something inside of me changed forever. Time and space stopped, and the personality I was ceased for a microsecond, and I was at a different level of being, coming to, so to speak. I realized that I had much work to do on my mind, my thinking, and my life as a whole. Truth had touched me. The next day, Indra Devi said, Swami will see all the Westerners in a group tomorrow. And the following day, the women put on their best saris and the men their whites, all looking spotless. Then it rained, quieted down for, and we looked like drowned rats. And Sai Baba did not see us that day or for several days afterward. At that time, we had not heard of Swami's famous tomorrow statements. It was explained to us that Sai Baba was not bound by time and space, and that tomorrow could mean any time in the future. Now, my husband had a rather short fuse and was used to the business world. As several days dragged on, he became more and more impatient that Swami had not seen us and he wanted to leave. But I did not and prayed to Swami that we could stay. In the meantime, Indra Devi was writing one of her yoga books and came to us for help in typing it, kind of kept us busy helping her. Then someone came to her rooms and said, Swami would see us that afternoon. Now, prior to the trip at the university, some of us got together and decided that what we all wanted to know was how to attain self-realization the experience of the true or real self. <clears throat> and I was determined to ask that question, and I mentioned this to a lady who was living there, and she said, write the question down 
and take it with you into the interview room. I didn't know why I should do that, but I followed her advice. There were about eight or nine of us that gathered on the porch for the interview. I was really nervous, not knowing what to expect. Swami appeared at the doorway with a smile and beckoned us in. I was last in line and sat to his side. For a while he chatted with people that were regulars there and then started going around the room from the men's side giving the booty to upraised hands. Well, here came that darn for booty again. I really didn't want any, but so as not to be rude, I also put my hands up. Swami went around the room giving it to everyone and then stopped in front of me, turned, and started to walk back to his chair. So I quickly put my empty hands down, but then he turned to me again and, again and said, Oh, did you want some? And put the booty on my forehead. I was pretty amazed that he probably read my mind. Plus, being in the proximity of his presence and that divine energy, I could barely breathe. He then started asking each one what they wanted to know and was coming to me. And I remembered the question, but not the order of words so that it made sense, so I did have to look at that note. I then asked him how we could obtain self-realization, to which he gave a small discourse. Simply put, he said that the mind is a bundle of threads and desires that form a cloth and each thread must be removed one by one so that only the cotton remains. And if the cotton is burnt by desirelessness, then the cloth ceases to exist. In a later writing, he said, once it is realized that the mind is the cause of minus, my body, my mind, and that it is made of desires, then one will strive to achieve the state of samadhi in which all agitations in the mind cease. In a later time, it was explained to me by Dr. Gokok that Swami is not really reading our minds, but is letting us know that He is us. So I've always had in mind, and these are my own thoughts, that the cloth is our personality, which is made up of our desires and probably all of our reactions to life experiences, and that the real person we are is our inner divine nature with which Swami is in touch or is. On that March trip to India, it was also the time of Shivaratri, so that we experienced one of the most unusual celebrations of India at the ashram where Swami creates tons of vibhuti from a small vessel, the ceremony uh, called the vibhuti adashe. And he also, of course, creates the lingam at that time. I have since come to understand that vibhuti is the end of all matter and desire, the ultimate reality which remains when the dross of ego is burned away by the fire of illumination is also sacred prasad for healing of sickness, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. At the end of the trip, I knew that Sai Baba was the one for me, and that he is the ultimate experience in divinity. But I also thought I would never go back to India again, a difficult trip at best, and so very hot. Well, I went back again the same year for Christmas, and many times thereafter. There's a wonderful poem by an early English poet, Francis Thompson, called The Hound of Heaven. In it, he describes the journey to God as a chase between God, the hound, and the person chased, or the quarry. It's a lengthy poem, but I'll just uh, quote a paragraph. Because we all tend to put the God business to the future, or push it aside, yet he is always there. And here's the poem. I fled him down the nights and down the days, 
I fled him down the arches of the years. <laughs> 